This is a selection of short videos that cover many of the aspects that existed on Herod's Temple Mount. It's quite long, so do check out the menu in the details and jump to the part that interests you. Almost all the descriptions you will hear today are taken in some way or form from Lean Ritmeyer's great book, The Quest, revealing the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a must-have for anyone interested in this ancient biblical site. On the southern end of the western wall of Herod's Temple Mount is Robinson's Arch, named after the American explorer Edward Robinson, who identified the skew back of an arch in 1838. This great flight of steps leads up to the Royal Stoa. Warren's Gate, named after Sir Charles Warren, is the most northern gate on the western side of the Temple Mount and is mentioned by Josephus. The location was probably chosen to give direct access to the Temple Mount from the street and would have come out near the Caponius Gate on the Temple Mount. Barclays Gate, named after Dr. James T. Barclay, is the most southern gate on the western side of the Temple Mount and would have come out nearer the south, close to Robinson's Arch entrance and the Royal Stoa. Part of the massive lintel stone of this gate can still be seen on the remaining part of the western wall today. Wilson's Arch, named after Charles Wilson, a British engineer in the mid-19th century who was the first person to explore the arch in modern history. The arch is part of a row of arches that supported this large bridge connecting the Temple Mount with the upper city. The Kiponos Gate is believed to have been situated directly after the entrance from Wilson's Arch onto the Temple Mount supposedly named after Caponius, the first Roman procurator of Judea. These two huge entrances to the Temple Mount on the Southern Wall were originally named the Holder Gates, most likely after an Old Testament prophetess who lived in Jerusalem at the time of King Josiah. They are most widely known as the Triple Gate and Double Gate for obvious reasons. Both take a route through the lower sections of the Temple Mount and lead up to the platform just past the Royal Stoa. Some researchers have proposed that due to the beautiful carved domes in the ceiling of the double gate, it could have been the beautiful gate mentioned in Acts 3 where the lame man was healed by the apostles Peter and John. In between the staircases leading up to the two southern gates were situated two buildings. Excavations show the remains of several mikvahot or ritual baths in the westernmost building here on the left, insinuating a building for ritual cleansing, while the right building was probably a public building of some kind. The large eastern gate also known as the Shushan Gate, is believed to be the gate through which the red heifer was led out to the Mount of Olives to be burnt. Although there is another gate on this side, it gives entrance to the Herodian underground areas that we know as Solomon's stables, and it's not a gate as such. Also, according to the Mishnah, there was only one gate in the Eastern Wall. Today, the now blocked Golden Gate is located just above the ruins of this once large Eastern entrance to the Temple Mount. Just prior to the Shushan Gate was an entrance through the city wall known as the Mifkad Gate. Its whereabouts aren't fully known, but we know that it was close enough to the Eastern Gate for the priests to carry the sacrifices out to the Mount of Olives. Very little archaeological evidence exists in regards to the most northern wall of the Temple Mount. 
It is only from the accounts of Josephus that we know that a gate even existed. Logically, it can only have been situated between the Antonia Fortress and the Pool of Israel. It appears that the Pool of Israel existed in some form or another right up until the 1930s when it was filled in. Warren investigated the bottom of the pool and found the plastered floor 23 metres below the level of the Temple Mount Courts. Built on the quarried out remains of the Bedrock Hill to the north of the Temple Mount stands the Antonia Fortress, built by Herod and supposedly named after his friend, Mark Antony. With its large bedrock foundation and high protective walls, the fortress was almost unassailable. Used as a military headquarters and barracks to protect the Temple Mount, some believe that the Antonia Fortress was the site where Jesus was tried for high treason, while others believe that he was held in the Praetorial, a part of Herod's palace in the west of the city. Just to the north of the Antonia Fortress was the Strothian Pool, which supplied the Antonia Fortress with water. During the capture of the Antonia in AD 70, the Romans built a siege ramp in the middle of this pool and, after battering the walls of the fortress, gained access to the Antonia and thereafter the Temple Mount. In accordance with the Mosaic commands of Deuteronomy 22.8, parapets were built along the edges of the roofs to prevent people falling. During the excavations of the Temple Mount, a large corner parapet stone was found lying on its side. The stone was evidently a parapet stone, but what made it unique was that a large niche was cut out of the inner slope on its southern side. Above this niche was the inscription in Hebrew, which read, Lebet Hadkia Lahak. The first two words, Lebet Hadkia, mean to the place of trumpeting, but the last Hebrew word is incomplete. Scholars have suggested completing the inscription with Lehekal, meaning to the temple, Lahakon, meaning for the priest, or Lahakris, meaning an ounce. The last suggestion would make the inscription read, to the place of trumpeting to an ounce, which was the most widely supported. This fallen stone would most likely originally have been situated on the southwestern corner of the parapet of the roof of the royal stoa. From this elevated position, a trumpet call could be heard all over the city. The Royal Stoa, also known as the Royal Colonnade or Royal Portico, was an ancient basilica constructed by Herod the Great during his renovation of the Temple Mount at the end of the 1st century BC. Probably Herod's most magnificent secular construction, the three-aisled structure was described by Josephus as deserving to be mentioned better than any under the sun. A centre of public and commercial activity, the Royal Stoa was the likely location of Jesus' cleansing of the Temple recounted in the New Testament. Initially, following the plans from the quest, I made the stoa with a pitched roof of clay tiles. But, after discussion with Lean, it seems that in the excavation of the Temple Mount, no clay tiles were found, making it very unlikely that these were used. Subsequently, I went with the Roman-style flat roof. Below the platform, at the southeast part of the Temple Mount, are huge underground vaults that are mistakenly called Solomon's Stables. The Crusaders who seized the Temple Mount from the Muslims in the 11th century assumed the rooms must have been used to stable the horses of King Solomon, whereas these vaults were most likely built to support the corner of the expanded Temple Mount and then the space utilised for storage. Just outside the main buildings that surround the temple, on the large platform, was a balustrade or railing called the Sorig in Hebrew. At certain intervals, this barrier carried inscriptions in Greek and Latin forbidding any non-Jew to enter. The text on the inscription reads, No Gentile might enter within the railing around the sanctuary and within the enclosure. Whosoever should be caught will render himself liable to the death penalty, which will inevitably follow. The hell, or terrace, 
could be reached by climbing these 12 steps. It was considered to be holy ground and has been suggested that this was the place where Jesus sat at the age of 12, listening to the teachers and asking questions. The Court of the Women was the furthest point at which women were allowed to enter the temple precincts. At certain times of the year, the women and men would be separated from each other, with the women having to stand on the balconies surrounding the court. Fragments of floor tiles from the Herodian period have been found and reassembled to reveal what would most likely have been the style and pattern of the tiles that were laid beneath the porticos in the court of the women. Thirteen collection boxes called chauffeurs were situated in the court of the women. They got their names from the chauffeur-like trumpet that funneled out on its end. It is in one of these chauffeurs that the widow's mite would most likely have been dropped. Another notable feature in the court of the women is the presence of the four massive lampstands. At just over 26 metres high, the priests would need to scale the ladders to pour the oil needed to light these menorahs or lamps. A stairway of 15 semicircular steps led up from the court of the women to the court of the Israelites. On these steps, the Levites would have sung the 15 Psalms of Ascents, which are Psalms 120 to 134. At the top of the 15 steps was the imposing Nicanor Gate. According to Josephus, the large doors of the gate were of Corinthian bronze and far exceeded in value those plated with silver and set in gold. The gates were usually kept open so that worshippers could follow the proceedings in the temple court. Once through the Nicanor Gate, through the court of the Israelites and up the steps of the Duchan, we enter the temple court, where we find the altar, the lava, and the place of slaughter. The altar was made of unhewn stones as stipulated in Exodus 20, 25, and, like the original altar of burnt sacrifice built in the wilderness, was used for animal sacrifices and burnt offerings. Before the priests carried out their duties, they had to wash their hands and feet in the water from the brass lava. To wash himself, a serving priest would stand below one of the 12 faucets of the lava and let the water run over his hands and feet while laying the right hand on the right foot and the left hand on the left foot. Finally, there was the place of slaughter, where all of the animals were brought and then slaughtered. No animal was killed until the great gate leading to the sanctuary itself was opened. Hearing the noise made by the door, the designated priest would begin the sacrificial process. Josephus called Herod's temple a structure more noteworthy than any under the sun. The temple was indeed a colossal structure, measuring 100 cubits in length, breadth and height. It stood on a six cubit high solid foundation and had two storeys, each 45 cubits high, including a roof structure of five cubits. On the roof was a parapet of three cubits in height, on which were one cubit high golden spikes, made to prevent birds from perching on the roof's edge and fouling the temple. The total height of the temple was therefore 100 cubits. Climbing the 12 steps, we enter into the porch or ulam, where we see the golden vine with grape clusters trained over four posts or pillars. The vine was quite famous and free will offerings were made in the form of a golden leaf, berry or cluster which the priests would attach to this vine. When Jesus depicted himself as the true vine, he was likely contrasting himself with this artificial vine, one producing fruit in the form of worldly praise, pride and temporary status, the other in the form of spiritual fruit and eternal life. We can see above the doors four windows bringing a little light into the sanctuary, each window adorned with a golden crown in accordance with scriptures in Zechariah 6:14.
The opening to the sanctuary had two sets of double folding doors that when opened up fitted perfectly into the recesses in the passageway to the sanctuary. Once inside, we can see the menorah or lampstand on the south side of the sanctuary. The table of showbread on the north and the altar of incense on the west. All three in the exact same positions and manner as they were positioned according to scripture in the first tabernacle in the wilderness. Things differ, however, when we go behind the massive veil that divides the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. We would have expected to find the Ark of the Covenant, but it was completely empty. The Ark of the Covenant having been lost in 586 BC when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. At least, archaeologists have found no reliable records after this date. So the Holy of Holies stood empty and the high priest could only offer incense on the rock where the Ark would have stood. Around the sanctuary itself was a network of 38 cells built in three storeys. These would have been used for storage and repositories of vessels and supplies for the temple ritual. There is another passageway leading to a staircase called the Mesibar that itself led up to the first roofed section. Going around the roof to the south, there is another entrance which leads to the upper chamber. Here we can see access holes in the floor above the Holy of Holies which would have allowed men to be lowered down for cleaning or repairing. Finally, there is mention of two slanting beams which somehow allowed access to the roof, but there is no information beyond that. As the height to the roof was quite far, I made the executive decision to make a wooden scaffold with ladders which could be assembled and disassembled when needed. From here at the top of the temple, one could see over almost all of Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside. According to Midot 1.3, it was through the kindling gate that wood for the altar was brought in and stacked into wood piles. The high priest would have lived in the wood chamber for seven days preceding his service on Yom Kippur. The gate of the firstlings, or firstborn, is where the firstborn offerings were brought into the court and, according to the Temple Institute, they were attributed a lower level of sanctity and therefore their slaughter was permitted anywhere in the court. Because of this, they were brought in on the southern side. In the Gola chamber was a water wheel to draw water from the Gola cistern situated below. From this chamber, water was supplied to the entire court. The water gate is the easternmost gate through this gate, a flask of water from the Shilohak spring was brought up to the temple to be used for the water libation, which took place on the festival of Sukkot. This chamber is generally identified with the council chamber where the Sanhedrin would have sat. This gate could also have been called the Gate of Song, and it was the gate through which the Levites and the musicians entered to reach the platform. The Parba, or salt chamber, was used for the conservation of hides by salting. On the roof was a mikvah, in which the high priest would immerse himself on the Day of Atonement. Through the gate of offering were brought the offerings of the highest level of sanctity. In the rinsing chamber, the intestines of the sacrificial animals were rinsed. The gate of Jeconiah was the westernmost gate of the northern gates, named after King Jeconiah, who exited through this gate en route to the Babylonian exile at the end of the first temple period. The chamber of the hearth had four side rooms. 
The northeastern room had steps leading down to underground washing baths for the priests, known as a mikvah. A second was used for housing the animals that were to be offered on the altar, a third for storing the showbread, and a final one for the previous altar stones that were defiled by Antiochus IV Epiphanes, when he profaned the temple by erecting idols and sacrificing animals to Zeus. The chamber of the lepers was on the northwest side of the court of the women. An Israelite with leprosy would come to this chamber and follow a ritualistic process of cleansing in accord with the Mosaic instructions. Jesus refers to this when he heals the leper in the Gospels. He tells him to show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Lean goes into greater detail on this in his book. The northern gate gave access to the court of the women from the north. To the northeast was the chamber of the woodshed, where priests with a blemish had the task of examining logs for woodworm. If woodworm was found in a log, it would be disqualified for use on the altar. The eastern gate gave access to the court of the women from the east. To the southeast was the chamber of the Nazarites, where, on completion of their vows, consecrated men would come to be released from them. The southern gate gave access to the court of the women from the south. The fourth chamber on the southwest was called the chamber of the house of oil, where oil and wine were stored. So I hope you enjoyed your very long walkthrough of the Temple Mount today. I have literally scraped the surface of the details of Herod's Temple Mount, and if you are interested to know more, I highly recommend Lean Ritmeyer's wonderful book, The Quest, revealing the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where he covers the history of this ancient biblical landmark. As I learned about all these chambers and places on the Temple Mount, I found myself imagining what Jesus and his disciples would have been surrounded by, the comings and goings of priests and the rigid rituals surrounding the temple service. This was the backdrop for the revelation of the real temple of God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the one who would transform worship from the head to the heart, from the physical location of Jerusalem to that of spirit and truth. So next time you visit Jerusalem and see all the existing parts of this ancient site, remember that it once was a very real place, that the Bible narrative is a very real history, and that Jesus was a very real person with very good news. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Hopefully I will be back with another Bible scene before too long. If you want to see more, please consider supporting me and this vision to produce Bible scenes that can be used free of charge for the whole world to see. So from me, Jeremy, signing off until next time, may God's blessings be upon you all. Shalom.